Welcome, listeners. I hope you're having a fantastic day or night. And just wanted to say, if you're brand new to this podcast, welcome to Stories, Fables, Ghostly Tales, where I cover the creepiest, strangest, and most unique and original stories that I can get my hands on and share them with you. Today, courtesy of Carl Brandt, we have part five, act one of Michi's journey. Turn the lights off, the sound up, and get ready for an original story. Upon the visit of the Fugurama Yohi, I started to wonder if I was getting some sort of spiritual awareness. Why am I all of a sudden seeing yokai all around me? The voice in my head asked. My thoughts were interrupted by the low groan echoing from the cave entrance. I immediately was able to tell it was Ron, as he stumbled his way to the site, followed by the rest of the team. Half of them were hung over like Ron, groaning and using the cave wall as a guide, and the other half dragged their feet. Ron saw me sliding the cover journal into my pack, but didn't say anything other than, Morning, in a groggy tone. He shuffled toward the library as I did. So, have a little too much to drink last night, I assume? I jabbed at him. Yeah, thanks for not cutting me off last night. He jabbed back, as he playfully shoved me. I couldn't talk any sense into you, I said, as I gently hit the beam next to me and pushed off to stand back upright. Well, I had a good time either way. He brushed off the dust that had gotten onto my shoulder. I searched the group for Jane. She was toward the back. She was definitely hung over. Jane was holding her head. I patted Ron on the shoulder and headed her way. Hey, Jane, do you want some water? I asked, hoping for a yes. Jane groaned and extended a hand to accept the water as she spoke in a slightly hoarse voice. Uh, did I embarrass myself last night? I handed her a bottle of water. No, but you did confess I'm a mystery to you, and that you love mystery. Her eyes widened <sighs> as she choked on the water, spitting a bit back out. I said what? She exclaimed, before she started chugging the water with a slight blush spreading over her face. She finished the bottle of water and collected herself with a slight pink still present in her cheeks. I'm sorry if I was a bit, um, forward last night. She looked down like a schoolgirl talking to a crush. Maybe if you're free later, we can grab dinner and talk a little? Her voice trailed off a bit as she finished the sentence. Sure, I would love that, I stated as a dark red blush spread through my cheeks. Jane giggled <laughs> and walked off to her assigned area to complete the day's work. I decided I should go to my area and do the same. Around three in the afternoon, I had cleared out a large section of books and placed them into the transportation cases, which regulated humidity and temperature to preserve the documents. I noticed a small area in the wall, behind where the books had been stored, that housed a secret compartment. Upon further inspection of the compartment, I found a small bottle. Pulling the small cork, the aroma of alcohol hit me like a ton of bricks. I flung my head away from the potent smell and coughed a little. <laughs> as I capped the bottle and slid it into my pack. I think I'll keep this for later, my inner monologue stated. At four in the afternoon, I took a break and broke into my store-bought bento. It was delicious, a rolled omelette with rice and chicken katsu, and a healthy side of steamed seasoned vegetables. Around five in the afternoon, we decided to call it a day and head for the hotel. Jane once again approached me on the walk back if only for a short while. I look forward to dinner tonight. Let's meet in the lobby at around 9. Before I could say anything, she rushed off to hang out with the other girls in the group for the remainder of the walk. Ron overheard Jane and nudged me with an elbow. Look at this stud muffin right here. His grin grew with each word. Scoring a date with the hottest girl on the trip? He was playfully giving me a noogie now. I couldn't tell if it was out of congratulations or jealousy. I'm slightly jealous. He had answered the question that I had never said out loud and released my head from the lock. The other single guys were just glaring at me. Doesn't really matter. I think she wants to apologize for what she said when she was drunk last night. I said, trying to dismiss rumors and speculation. Ron, 
seemed to just shrug and pat my shoulder. Well, I wish you luck. And with those final words, we arrived back at the hotel. Jane waved bye to me and so did Ron, as we all went to our separate rooms. Once I entered my room, I took out the bottle that I had found and cleaned it up a bit. It was a simple bamboo bottle, but there seemed to be an eye and mouth that protruded from the bottle. Both are closed. I placed the journal on the desk in the room and the bottle in the upper right hand corner. I decided to go take a shower and bath before I sat down to relive more of Michi's life. The hot water of the shower, washing away the day's grime, felt amazing. I got into the tub and relaxed after the shower. Upon exiting the bathroom, I noticed the bottle's eye was now open. Was it always like that? I could have sworn it was closed before. My inner self stated before shrugging it off as a false memory. I sat down to begin my session with Michi. I opened the book and turned to the last page he left off on and began his next journey. Michi returned to the temple from his exorcism of Kikku and began his monk training that was specific to his temple. Since Michi's first fight with the Sarugami, he had aged to be roughly about 13 years old. The next year was a blur of him learning to use the monk's traditional staff, which was a wood staff, with large rings affixed to the top with four smaller rings residing on the larger ring, which they called a kakara. He was taught more in the ways of Buddhism and the meaning of the four rings on his kakara. Each ring represented one of the four noble truths. The first truth being the truth of suffering. It states that birth, aging, death, union of the displeasing, separation of the pleasing, and not getting what you want is suffering. The second truth is the origin of suffering, which is summed up by craving anything. The third noble truth is cessation of suffering, which states releasing cravings or not relying on it is total freedom from it. The fourth noble truth is leading to the cessation of suffering, which stated that you have to walk the eightfold path, meaning you have to have the right view, intention, speech, action, livelihood, effort, mindfulness, and concentration. Michi spent months trying to comprehend these subjects he had spent countless hours meditating for in various places. He finally had his enlightening moment while sitting under a waterfall meditating late in the spring the next year, and just a couple of days shy of his 14th birthday. Michi earned his right as a warrior monk, as well as an accomplished and extremely young Onmoji. Michi was given his kakara and told he may come and go from the temple as he pleased, but he must embark on his own path to enlightenment. He thanked the monks who helped raise him and teach him all the way to this point, but he has to find his own path now, setting out on his new journey towards Mount Kurama. After a week's travel, he was just entering the territory when out of nowhere, something latched onto his shoulders from above. Talons gripped his robes tightly and hoisted him high into the air, flying at breakneck speeds towards the middle of the forest. Michi looked up to see a Kotengu, its skin a sickly grey brown colour with deep yellow eyes and a large rounded nose sitting atop a bird's beak with razor sharp teeth lining it. The Kotengu wore the tattered robes of a monk and had long white hair, but a small hat sat upon its head connected by a thin string tied under its chin. Large black wings sprouted from its back, as well as its feet resembling that of a bird's, but it had human hands that ended in long nails. He had read about these lesser Tengu. They had no respect for humans and constantly tried to trick them or just ate them. Some were so cruel as to whisk people away to drop them in the middle of the woods or in some cases to tie children high into a tree and let them die slowly and rot. Michi could only guess that this one planned to do one of the two last options to him, as he was still seen as a child. The Kotengu cawed like a crow, and Michi could feel the talons release from his garb. He began his freefall. Michi estimated he was at least 20 feet from the highest tree and another 50 to 60 from the ground. He had to improvise fast or he was dead. Above him, he could hear the cackle of the Kotengu <laughs> laughing as he watched his victim fall. Michi could just make a Kakai stairway to the ground, but he feared as he was already falling too fast and hitting a Kakai would either one, break a couple of bones, or two, kill him on impact. 
Michi was only 10 feet from the top of the tree now. He spread his body out as much as possible to create the largest amount of drag possible and aimed for a treetop. He planned to use the smaller, weaker branches to help him decelerate enough to catch a thicker, sturdier branch underneath. His plan went surprisingly well. The first 10 feet of the tree was soft enough to reduce his speed by half, and around 30 feet from the ground, his Kakara caught for a split second between two branches, then snapped. This gave him enough time to land on a branch five feet below him, where he climbed down relatively fast and found the head of the Kakara. He quickly attached it to his pack, which he set down and took a stance ready to draw his katana, when he realized it was missing. Michi looked up as the Kotengu scowled down at him in disappointment. His victim was still alive. It threw a temper tantrum. How, How are, are you still, still alive? alive? He screamed while waving his arms around. Michi noticed that the beast had stolen his katana. The Kotengu swooped down and stood before Michi, breathing heavily from his anger. I won't let you leave this mountain alive. The monster rushed Michi with inhuman speed. And with a swift draw of Michi's own sword, the monster made a vertical slash that would cleave Michi in half. If it had connected. Michi took a slight step forward that got behind the guard of the katana and caught the yokai's hand mid-strike with his right and with his left, simultaneously threw a left jab with conviction. This struck the yokai to the left of his center line. Michi could feel a handful of the beast's bones break before the force of the punch launched the whole monster backward into a tree. The force of the impact with the tree made the beast release both the katana and the scabbard. Michi exhaled deeply as he calmed down. <sighs> Release the beast's suffering, he said to himself in his head as he stood over the now crippled Kotengu. The Kotengu looked up with despise in his eyes. A, A human, human defeated, defeated me? me? Is, Is this, this possible? possible? It squawked and cawed in anger. You, you can't, can't get, get rid, rid of me. You're, you're too weak. weak. It continued to shout insults at Michi, but to no avail. It couldn't get a rise out of Michi. As he stared down at the crippled creature with pity, in his eyes. Kek. Kek. A quick Kakai surrounded the Katengu as he made the seal of the thunderbolt with his hands and began the mantra, On by Shiramantaya Sawaka. His hands moved to the seal of the great thunderbolt, On Ishanaya Intaraya Sawaka. The seal of the outer lion, On Jitarashi Itara Jimaratano Sawaka. To the seal of the inner lion, on Hayabishariya Mantaya Sawaka. The seal of the outer bond was made next. On Nomaku Sanmara Basaradan Ka. The seal of the inner bonds. On Anganaya Inmaya Sawaka. To the seal of the wisdom fist. On Irotai Chanoga Jivatai Sawaka. He smoothly transitioned to the seal of the rising sun. On Chirichi Iba Rotaya Sawaka. He ended with the seal of the hidden form, On Arabasha no Sawaka. His aura radiated a dull blue light as the Katengu started to disintegrate. The whole time the beast yelled profanities and vowed vengeance on the monk. Michi released the Kakai once the threat was gone and looked around. He never noticed it before, but there were children's corpses strung up in the trees in various states of decay, from just bones to a couple of days old. Michi was appalled at the sight. He was barely older than most of them, and they had their lives snatched away. He reached down and picked up his katana, fastening it to his obi. That's when Michi was startled by some rustling in the brush, when a young woman stumbled out in a ripped kimono. Her dark brown hair had clumps of dirt, twigs, and leaves. The woman was at least 16. Her skin was fair with red scratches on her arms and legs. A small trail of dried blood ran down the inside of her thigh. Upon seeing Michi, she rushed to his side, bawling her eyes out. Please, monk, protect me. She clenched his kimono sleeve and slightly hid behind him. A new set of rustling came from the same direction. And that is where Act 1 concludes. Stay tuned tomorrow for Act 2. And 
I wonder how all of you lovely listeners would fare in this world. If you knew you lived in a world of yokai, would you be a hunter? Would you change your profession? Or would they be treated as just another type of animal in that world? Let me know what you think in the comments or via email, and I'll read out your answers in tomorrow's episode. Thank you so much for listening, lovely people. Oh, and tomorrow's episode may be a little late, so my apologies in advance for that, but I'll work hard to get it up on SoundCloud by the day's end. And on that note, you fantastic listeners, it's that time. This is the place where stories live, and you telltellers come to listen. Enjoy your day or night, and join me every weekday for our creepy tradition. And as always, till next time.